Patience and persistence is key. It took me 10 years to become successful. Do what you need to do. I think the biggest problem in our industry is one month, two months, they don't see the result. You have to keep putting in that work and the work will take care of you. Ladies and gentlemen, my name is Ron Sally and welcome back to another episode of More Than A Sale where it's not just about the successes that an individual achieves in the real estate industry, but it's about the setback, failures, heartbreaks, the pain, sorrows, to get to where they are today. And today I have such an individual. She has sold over $1.5 billion in volume of real stay the queen bee of the pre-construction industry sarah mahmood welcome to our episode thank you ron that's quite the intro thank you very much how do you think you come across for everybody i'm very focused i'm obviously very very driven i wake up every day and i do the same consistent activities day in and day out you know for me i was like i need to make this work because i really have no other options out there my dad's business lost everything he had i had to drop out of university which was very tough for me at that time the structure that i have in my life that I've built, I don't think it will allow me to ever go back to that. I think that keeps me going. Today, I have such an individual who is not only a dear friend, but a superstar in the real estate industry. She has been ranked number three in Ontario for Royal LePage, number six worldwide in Royal LePage. She has sold over $1.5 billion in volume of real estate. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I would say the queen bee of the pre-construction industry, Sarah Mahmood, welcome to our episode. Thank you, Ron. That's quite the intro. Thank you very much. No, but let's be honest here. I think, uh, and I can personally say this as well, having worked with many individuals mm -hmm. there's only one name that really stands out when we think of top female leaders in the pre-construction industry and that's you we've been friends for a very long time now and uh when i think when we first met i was like i didn't really like you in the beginning i was like you're rude and you don't say Wait, hello what? properly yeah and uh, and then as i got to know you a little bit more i was like wow you're such a sweetheart yeah you got a tough demeanor but you're really a softie on the inside and you have a great space for animals and you're very caring and you're really helpful but about your business as well at the same time so you know when you know when they say strong independent women that's that's the embodiment of you when i think of you what does a person have to do in this industry to be always at the top of their game what do you do to keep up. I think for me, like how you said that, you know, maybe I don't speak as much um, to people at events and so forth. It's because I have to be very, very focused and I have a very strict schedule that I follow to the T. So I know that when I go to these events, I can spend one hour there and get what I need done, which is meet the builder, take your photos, listen to the presentation and leave. Or I could spend four hours there chit chatting with every agent and then I'm completely off my schedule. I run, you know, a team. I'm responsible for a lot of other people and there's a lot to get done in a day so it doesn't I don't mean to come off as rude but I know that I need to stay very very focused in those moments yeah and you know when you go to the office I feel like people keep stopping me they have questions they want to talk about their listings they want to know in half an hour how I built my entire life and it just doesn't work like that so for me being very very focused sticking to my schedule and scheduling, you know, my priorities more than anything else is what's like keeps me on track. So let me ask you this again, I've, since we know each other, uh, you know, as friends, we've mm -hmm. traveled together, we've been on trips together and we've also worked together as well. When I see you in action working and everyone knows that you do an incredible job and of course your volume speaks for itself. How do you think you come across to everybody? I think that people think that I'm very focused. I'm obviously very, very driven. I think my focal point is that I'm a very strong personality and I yeah. don't take no for an answer. And I live my life like that. I wake up every day and I do the same consistent activities day in and day out. It doesn't matter to me how many deals I did yesterday or the last month or the last year. I wake up with that every day at zero mentality because I know that there's younger, smarter, faster agents who are out there to take your business. And you have to really be at the top of your game to be able to stay in this industry. So it's a very small industry, but the agents change fast. And how did you become this person did it were you always like this was there a period in your life where you sort of decided that no you know what enough is enough and I and I have to be at the top of my game or I have to achieve this or I have to achieve that what sort of led you to where you are today well I think the main thing to know about me is that when I came to Toronto I had nothing so I how was, long ago was that so that was um, 2003 okay so basically I grew up in Pakistan that's where my upbringing was I went to high school there I went to the States for my undergrad. That was for the first two years. 
After those first two years, my dad's business went sideways. He pretty much lost everything he had. And he said, I can't afford your education anymore. I had to drop out of university in the States, which was very tough for me at that time, because that's where I was like, what do you mean I have to drop out of university? Like, that wasn't even a thing to me. And he said, these are the last $18,000 I have. Figure it out. Yeah. My tuition at that time was 33000 US a year. I said, no, no, I need 65000 to continue yeah. school. They said, we don't have it. Yeah. So I had to moved to Toronto all by myself. I finished my education. Luckily, I was able to pay that off with the money that I did have. But then once I graduated, I had nothing. I was on my own. You know, to come from having everything that I needed as a child to now it being taken away and saying, okay, you're in a new country. You have no family here. You have no friends here and you're completely independent. Start your journey. So that's kind of where I was at. You know, I lived in an apartment at Keel and Finch for $300 a month that I shared with three other people at that time. And that was my beginnings. You know, I worked at a bookkeeping company for $1,200 a month, paid 300 rent and lived off the rest. Like I couldn't even go to McDonald's and like upsize my fries. That's how like poor I was at that time. And I could relate to that because same thing. I went through the same, when, when my family came here again, not a dollar to the name and I didn't have McDonald's till I was, you know, in my teens. So I know exactly what you're talking about. Let me ask you a question. You mentioned about your father when he gave that phone call to you and he told you, Hey, we don't have enough money to pay for your tuition and you know we can't afford it and things are going sideways first off what were you feeling what were you thinking what were the thoughts that were going on in your mind what did you and the family collectively do to sort of solve the problem where you're like okay cool does this mean I'm on my own now what was going through your mind at that point in time Listen, initially as a teenager, I was obviously very, very upset, mm. but I think very quickly from that, I had to like pivot my mindset and say, how can I make this work? I was used to luxury before that as a child. So, you know, for me, I was like, I'm going to be independent and I need to make this work because I really have no other options out there. In our culture back home, you know, girls are very reliant yeah. on their parents. Yeah. A lot of them just get married to like a rich guy or they have their parents feeding them. I didn't have any of that. And I said, I still still want to sustain and maintain the lifestyle that I had grown up with. It's been taken away from me, but now I need to bring it back and I need to do it on my own. So that motivation was there for me right from the start. And I said, I'm hungry. I want to be here. I want to make this work. So when I came to Canada, I came as an international student. Like I wasn't Canadian. I had to do the whole process all by myself, which was getting a work permit, getting started, finishing my education. I couldn't even hire a lawyer to do my immigration paperwork. I had to do it myself because I said, I can't spend $500 paying somebody else to fill these forms. So I literally had to do all of that from scratch. Do you find now that any time either you feel down and we're going to get into that as well. And I want to sort of know where your mindset is on those things. Mm -hmm. Do you ever remind yourself of how far you've come in the business or in your life of where everything was taken away from you and you had to build everything from scratch right on up and you had humble beginnings of having shared accommodation mm -hmm. and working for $1,200 a month at that point in time where your probably shoes are now worth way more. Yeah. Um, how do you remind yourself continuously that I've come a long way? Do you use that as motivation? Do you use that as fuel? What do you do? Yeah, like I kind of just like, I don't want to ever go back to that. I knew that I had my back up against the wall. I knew what it felt like at that time. And now I know that I don't ever want to go back there. I have to keep moving forward. And now this is my new norm. So the structure that I have in my life that I've built, I don't think it will allow me to ever go back to that because I'm so disciplined, motivated, and I have that structure to my day. I think that keeps me going. So now that we have this Sahar today that is accomplished, that has dollars to her name and isn't going through the same struggles that she was going through when she first initially started, what would you tell the younger Sahar knowing what you know now? I would say that you know, start every day again, like start every day at zero, pretend like you don't have anything, be very motivated. Patience and persistence is key. You know, people say, oh, you were an overnight success. It took me 10 years to become successful. So I was in this country for 10 years before I started making money. But it's that patience to keep working towards what you want, that persistence to keep working towards your goals, and then just waiting, but never stepping back. So you have to wake up and do what you need to do. I think the biggest problem in our industry is people do things for one month, two months, they don't see the results, and then they start pulling back. But you have to keep putting in that work and the work will take care of you. And I agree with you when you say that. Now, a lot of times we hear, you got to 
stay motivated. You got to get up the cliche statements. How do you stay motivated? Like, what is that process? Unless every single year, like I wake up beautiful. I wake up blessed. <laughs> everything is great. My life is amazing. I'm sure that's probably not the case. Cause even in, in the great moments we have in our life, there's certain days I wake up I'm like, Oh, you know, okay, cool. Let's, let's work through this. So how do you, what's your process? Explain that process for me and for our audience. I think for me, the way that I stay motivated is that I have a much bigger goal and that has to do with animal welfare. So I know that success for me now is just a platform to have my voice heard. So to be heard in this world, you have to have some level of swag, glamour, awards. And now I've started to use this platform that I've created because I get people following me who want to know what I'm doing all the time to really push out my message. And I don't know if you've noticed on my Instagram, but have, it's... Yeah. It's like three messages of projects and then one of like a mink farm. And then it's like four messages of another because people follow me to see my success. And I use that to be able to promote what I'm looking to promote. And let's not forget you uh, running into different countries, left, right and center. You know, I think you should put a whole clip of you running collectively together and you disappearing in like different places. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that success for me has now allowed me to be able to focus on those things that I really want, which is, for example, saving animals and dogs in Mexico because when you're in that place of you know when you, you don't have anything your whole focus is how do I feed myself how do I pay rent and your priorities are very focused on yourself but when you elevate yourself where now you're comfortable you own properties you're already driving the car you want you're wearing the clothes now you can actually start thinking about the next step as to what is my purpose and what can I give back to the world you can get to that stage until you reach that certain level of success. And I truly believe that because you're more worried about yourself. Now, animal welfare is a major priority and what you do with that is incredible. And uh, I've supported you as well with the yeah, cause. Yeah, thank you so much for that. Yeah, absolutely. I think what you're doing and, and you actually going out there, bringing the animals back and even I've seen videos and I haven't had a chance to meet your dog yet. <laughs> Maybe one day I will. And you know, you're bringing them, bringing the dog to the sites and you know, even even meeting them with the builders and developers, yeah. which, is, which is completely incredible. Let me ask you this this now kind of doing a little bit of shift in our conversation what's one period in your life that you felt that everything was just going haywire everything was either a out of your control b no matter what you do you would continuously to fail at it you thought your life was in the shambles what's that one moment in your life that you remember where you're like man this was not a good period in my life i think going back to when i was younger and you know when i told you that i we had everything and all of a sudden my father was saying you know, the business is, it's done. We need to go. We actually had to leave the country yeah. overnight. Yeah. So at that time, because the business deal had gone sideways, we had people standing outside our home with guns, oh, like wow. literally telling our, you know, my dad that we're going to kill your family if you don't pay us the money back. Yeah, yeah. And this went on for a period of, I would say 30 days. After that, my uncle said, you guys need to leave the country because something bad is gonna happen. We packed our suitcases and we literally had to leave the country like overnight. I had one suitcase. So what about all my stuff? Had to leave it behind. And how old and were I you think when that this was, was? How old were you when 18. this? 18. And wow. I think that was a very, very tough time because everything that I'd ever known was back in Karachi and all my friends, all my, you know, my, the home I'd grown up in everything. And all of that was just kind of taken away overnight. And it was a very, very tough time. And it's not like you were a little kid at the time. I mean, you're 18 years old. You're, you're, you're an adult. You're and, an adult. And all of this is happening in your adulthood. You're like, these are the prime years of my life. And we're having to go through this shift. And yeah. yeah. And I think for me now, um, it's all about having that element of self-control and I've learned that over time that you have to become very detached and undeterred by external ups and downs. And I think that's what keeps me focused in my business and leads to my success where, you know, the letdowns and the failures aren't, don't bring me down the same way as they would. And neither do the wins. Like, it's not like, oh my God, I'm, I'm number three in Canada and now I can chill for yeah. like a year. Yeah. And then at the same time, you know, when something bad happens, I don't let that drag me down and I try and keep myself stable in that sense. And I think that's really helped me in, in the journey of my business. How are your parents now? What are they up to? Where, where do they stand? Do you, do you support so, them? Uh, yeah. yeah. So now I support them. They live in England. So I still have oh, no wow. family in Canada till today. Okay. You say that proudly. You say that with a smile. I mean, I'm still doing everything yeah. on my own, you yeah. know? So yeah. So, and they're but okay. I'm proud of the journey. 
journey that I've been able to like now provide for my family. I'm able to support all these shelters in Mexico. So so what's next? Like what, what are you working on next now? What's your major goal with the shelter? Um, To open my own sanctuary. I think yeah. that's going to require a lot of funds, obviously. So building myself to that level of success where it's not just events once a year. Um, I actually have another event coming in December, but to have a full fledged sanctuary. And I think that that's what my success is where I want to take it to. And you would do that overseas? Let's see where it plays, but yes, most okay. likely. And right now your focus is Mexico? Right now the focus is Mexico. Are you going to sort of shift uh, grounds a little bit after Mexico or just kind of stick to Mexico for now? I think the problem is like those countries have a much more dire problem than yeah. first world country like Canada. It's also a lot cheaper to buy land there and actually have the sanctuary and the facilities. Wet care is a lot cheaper. So I think that's going to be the next transition before coming to Canada. Now tell me a little bit about your uh, your real estate business. Yeah. Uh, what would you say is your major mode of operation? What makes it super successful? Where do you have, where have you found major success with your business in terms of how you operate it? I think, ha- like I said, having that consistent structure and, you know, for me, I, I've been doing the same thing for the last 10 years. A lot of agents say, in our business, we don't want to spend any money, for example. Yeah. There's no other business in this world where you can say, I don't want to spend a dollar. But in real estate, for some reason, people say, I don't want to spend money on ads. I don't want to spend money on a CRM. I don't want to spend money on MailChimp. Why? So for me, it's like we have all our systems set up. We spend money on staff and we pump the money in because, you know, you need to get results. You have to put put it in as well. So I know you touched upon the structure a little bit, but what really is that structure that's that's worked for you day on and day on? Basically building my database over and over again. So when I was brand new, I was a rental agent. I did a hundred rentals my first year. I don't even know if you knew that, but literally I I got into the business. I had no contacts. I didn't grow up here. I had no network. So I started putting ads on Kijiji and I had maybe 3000 names and numbers in that first year from advertising and doing rentals. So to grow on that. So my first year in pre-construction, which was actually my second year in real estate, those are the people that I was selling to. And from there, Finally, I did, you know, maybe 80, 90 deals that first year in pre-construction. Started to get money in and then I started pumping money back into the business. I primarily focus now on Google advertising as well as nurturing the existing database. Wonderful. Now, let me ask you a question. When it comes to inspirations. Yeah. And I know, and I've shared this with you as well, of, uh, you know, people, whether it's in my office or even outside and they come and they ask about you and they mm. want to know what it's like with you. And, you know, having our friendship, uh, we've got a chance to, you know, enjoy different conversations. And I've heard and, I've, and you, what you're telling me, you've told me this before as well, mm. but I've never asked you this. Who are some of your inspirations? Who do you look up to? Who are some people that you follow or that you admire that have had, uh, you know, a positive impact in your life or people now currently that you're following that you're like, wow, I I really love their journey. I really love what they're about, whether it be male or female. I take a lot of inspiration from athletes, actually. I follow a lot of them on Netflix. All the shows I watch are about athletes, but Kobe Bryant would be one of them where, you know, he doesn't go with the norm. It's like all the other basketball players. You watch his documentaries, you listen to his podcast. They're all partying and he's up at four o'clock in the morning, kind of like you going to the gym and starting their day. And I look at their process and I really admire the structure that they have and how they really follow their schedule to a T and nothing deters from that. So I take a lot of inspiration and even though it's a different field, I feel like it can be implemented into any business. Is there anyone on social media or on Instagram uh, that you follow that you that you really love what they do or what they're about? It doesn't have to be motivational, inspirational. It could be just style. What is, is there any, any person that... Well, it's kind of motivational, but I love Jay Shetty. I think he has okay. a lot of inspiration to cool. share. Yeah. So I take a lot of insight from that. Cool. If there's a famous person that you can meet, alive or dead, uh, who would that person be? Um, Desmond Tutu, I think, is like somebody that, you know, he's a peacemaker. I feel like the way that he speaks and the way that he can communicate, he's really like a magnificent leader. So I've listened to a lot of his stuff. I think he passed away in 2021 and that would have been great to meet. That's incredible. Yeah. Is there a book that you've read in your life where... It, that even now till date that you always refer back to or that book made a positive impact in your life or are you reading something now? Yeah, so I'm reading a book right now. It's very interesting. It's called The Luck Factor. Okay. And it's by Richard Wiseman and he's a psychologist. And he, in this book, is basically going through the steps of why are some people 
lucky and some people unlucky. Like, what is it? So he does a whole series of experiments. He takes 400 individuals, some of who say that they're lucky in their life and some who say they're unlucky. And this spans all the way from doctors to factory workers. So it's a whole broad range of people. And he sets up this experiment and says, what makes people lucky and unlucky? And it's very, very interesting because he gives everybody a newspaper and says, count the number of photographs in this newspaper. And the lucky people finish the experiment in less than five seconds, while the unlucky people took two to three minutes. So what's up with that? So on page two, there was a note that says, stop counting, there's 43 photographs in this newspaper. The unlucky people were missing opportunities. They missed the note completely, they're still counting. You know, what this book talks about is that there's no such thing as lucky and unlucky. It's about seeing opportunities and bringing that so-called luck to you by being present, by being aware, and being you know, present in the moment, essentially. So it's very interesting because there's people who can create those opportunities by being aware and being present. I'm gonna read that book for sure. I read a lot of books as well. Yeah. I actually did a whole blitz uh, this morning. What I do is I for one hour, mm -hmm. I get four books and I set a timer for 15 minutes. Yeah. And I would read the book for 15 minutes with full focus. Then I'll take like two, three minutes and I kind of relax and I'll do it again with the second book and the third book. But all four of those books have to be different. Right. One is about business. One is a biography. Uh, one is a... Uh, uh, motivational book and another one has to be philosophical so that way you're getting a blitz uh, yeah. they call it blitz reading so it's now working up your brain and you're coming in right after that your ideas are just like in full spark mode and yeah. you're just ignited and then I just start writing down things that come to the mind 10x by Grant Cardone yeah, is a really good book. one too yeah solid book yeah when you need to plan something or you need to brainstorm something where do you find your ideas come from majority like do you have a moment where you sit quietly and kind of think about these things or did you just like on the fly they come and you're like okay cool no my biggest inspiration actually comes from being around guys like you okay. and I and I actually believe that like you when, when I'm around other platinum agents and top professionals in my industry yeah. and we're together and we're brainstorming we're discussing like what's working for them what's working for me and piling those ideas together and I take them back and I implement them into my business. And that's what I've been doing since the start. When I was brand new, because I wasn't part of a team and I didn't have a mentor, I would look up to the top reconstruction guys in the business at that time and see what are they doing? You know, try and speak with them, try and, you know, even observe them from far. If they're not in my network, examine what they're doing from far do and you take ideas and inspiration from do you them. Find, do you find a lot of people that you looked up to in the industry, like they kind of fell off or they kind of retired? Yes. Okay. So a lot of them, you know. Why is that? Why do you feel that? I think because the space has become a lot more overpopulated. And like I said, you have to have so much structure, so much drive to even be able to keep up. And what worked back then isn't working now. You have to have pivoted. You have to have shifted the way that you did things before. I've had to change the way I did things did. before. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't even know if you know this, but I didn't have Instagram till 2019. I actually had no even social videos. Media. Yeah, you were telling me as well when we, my, when we had a conversation about videos. So, yeah. so it's about like being able to pivot and being able to like reassess where are we in today's day and age, and then what does it take today to be successful? And I remember when you and I were chatting, and you're like, "Do your videos work? What kind of views are you getting?" And you were asking me all these questions, and I was like, and I go, "Why is Sarah asking this?" And then a week later, bam, Sarah comes out with like a bunch of videos in, and you were like, "Now you're on just a roll, and it's like so natural." Yeah, for you. I always thought yeah. that, oh my god, people are gonna like judge me. They're going to yeah. say, oh, she's making content. And people do. People are going to make comments and that's fine. And I think the biggest thing is like people say, oh, I made videos for six months, but I didn't get a deal out of it. And you have to look at it outside of that. The biggest um, companies out there like Coca-Cola, they don't put a billboard up there and say, oh, how many people drove by the billboard and then went to the gas station, and bought a Coke, but they still do it because social media is now sort of our advertising billboard where you do it consistently enough and you become like a name in people's mind. You become a brand, you build yourself, you build your presence. So it's very important to do that. But most agents don't think like that. They say, oh, we spent like six months posting and nothing came out of it. They're not thinking of it long term. So let me ask you this. And um, and I think this is probably the first time we're going to be asking this someone on the show. All the successful people 
that you've hung out with, whether it be builders, whether it be developers, whether it be outside influences. Mm-hmm. And, and I also get to have the pleasure of meeting these such individuals as well, time to time. What would you say is majority of how they've acquired their wealth of some of the people? They don't have to be real estate oriented. Maybe you've met someone that isn't real estate oriented. What are they doing or what are some of the things you've learned from them that you can share with our audience members that you kind of picked up from watching these successful individuals? Mm-hmm. And the third thing is out of all their platinum agents that we hang out with, what are some of the traits that you've picked up that these platinum agents do? Yeah, I think that the biggest inspiration to me actually does come from one of the platinum agents in this industry. And he's somebody who's young and he's somebody who's able to take multiple businesses and scale them. And I don't know if you know who I'm talking about, but like... Basically, he has three different businesses right now and he's successful in each and every one. So what I've realized is like these top platinums, they're not just successful in real estate. They're successful in terms of building a business and you can give them any business and they're able to take that and scale it. So it's very, very empowering to see because the traits that they have can be carried on to other businesses. I like that very much. Last question to end off our episode and end off the show. Who is Seher Mahmood? I think that now I want to be somebody who can actually motivate other women, motivate other individuals to be able to say that, you know what, you came here with nothing and you weren't given everything on a silver platter and you had to earn it and be able to take inspiration from that, share my story. I mentor a lot of women actually on Instagram now that reach out to me. We have one-on-ones and to be able to share my journey and also my success tips of the industry to be able to elevate their lives in terms of business, relationships and so forth. And if I can keep doing that and contributing to make their lives better as well as animals' lives better, I think I'm in a good spot. I love that. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for joining us on this episode. Not only is Sarah a dear friend, but she's a remarkable individual and a successful individual who perseveres in her field of work. And uh, she's an inspiration to many. I get a chance to learn a lot from her as well. I'm excited. So thank you for joining us on this episode. Stay tuned for the next episode on More Than a Sale.